Amen. All righty. Genesis chapter 25. Let's get right into this. So look at verse number one. I know we just read the entire chapter. We see here it says, Then again Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah. So Abraham, you know, Sarah's already been dead and buried, and he decides to take another wife unto him since his wife has, has died, and he has more children. It says, And she bare him Zimran and Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. And Jokshan begat Sheba and Dedan, and the sons of Dedan were Ashurim and Latushim and Leumim. And the sons of Midian, Ephah and Ephah and Hanak and Abida and Aldea, all these were the children of Keturah. But then look at verse number 5. It says, And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. Now, Isaac was the son of promise. Isaac is the one who, you know, God had promised that, that his um, blessings were going to come down upon. And it was going to go through that line. And Abraham knew this. And, you know, everything we have already read previously regarding God's promises unto Abraham and the reenactment of the gospel and Abraham offering up his son, you know, all these different things. They're extremely important. It's important for us to remember, you know, the New Testament, we've already gone through those passages in like Galatians chapter 3. You know, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. He's the son of promise. He's the, you know, it's a symbolism of our faith, of, of us as well inheriting the, the uh, blessings of, of our father Abraham through faith in Jesus Christ, because we're born into that family, we are also children of promise. Um, so he's where the focus is on. But, you know, I mean, there was nothing wrong with Abraham taking a wife again, you know, like later on in his years, Sarah's dead, and, and they have that companionship, and he had more children. And it's kind of amazing, too, he just, he, you know, that he even had more children after that. But... Um, what he did because he didn't want to have anything interfere with Isaac and with his blessings and with everything that God was doing for him. So what he did was any other children that he had, he sent them away. Just like you remember when Ishmael was sent away. Ishmael and Hagar were, were, were sent off. They cast out the bondwoman and her son after Isaac was born. They were, you know, Ishmael was mocking and, and whatever and... and Sarah wanted him gone, and, and God told Abraham, he's like, yeah, hearken unto, unto what she says, and do it. And that was fine for them to be, to be sent away. And now Abraham do, eventually does the same thing when he has more children. He doesn't want them any confusion about the inheritance, because Abraham was leaving everything that he owned unto Isaac. He was the one that was receiving the full blessing. So what he did, it says in verse 6, but unto the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac, his son, while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. So he's saying, okay, you know, he's not just sending them out empty. He's giving them some gifts, giving them some, some financial support to help them. Here you go. You can start a new life, but you need, you need to go, you know, east. You need to go a little bit further away um, because Isaac is going to be taken over here and taken over the inheritance and sticking around here. And he wanted no confusion, no um, strife, no, you know, people, you know, especially after Abraham dies. He doesn't want his children then fighting. No, we have a part in this too. We're Abraham's children also. You know, none of that. He made sure that was all clear and he even separated them to avoid any problems and any conflict as a result of, you know, after, after he died. But, um, then it says in verse 7, it says, And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived. And hundred, three score and fifteen years. Abraham lived to be 175 years old. Now, if you remember, before the flood, people were living to be like up to 900 years old, 800, 700, 800, 900 years old. But now we see that Abraham lives to be 170, which is still really old, especially these days. You know, Abraham is, is really old. You know, God's blessed him with a long life. Verse 8 says, Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. So 175 years, the Bible saying that's full of years. It's a good old man, a good old age. And it says in verse 9, And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, which is before Mamre, the field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth. 
there was Abraham buried and Sarah his wife. Now I think that oftentimes, and this is going to be part of the, the main theme of the sermon tonight, what I'm going to be going over. Um, I think Ishmael gets kind of a bad rap from people just because of his descendants and everything that's going to happen uh, later on. But I think Ishmael as a person, as the son of Abraham, I believe that he was saved. I believe that you know he loved Abraham. That's why he shows up here again. Even though he's already been kicked out, so to speak, they've been cast out. He's been left to live with his mom and, and to be separate from, from Isaac. Um, we still see that, that, you know, we know that Abraham loved Ishmael. We know that multiple times in previous chapters, Abraham was, was asking God to bless Ishmael, you know, and, and all your blessings would come upon Ishmael. And, and he really cared about him. And we see that, you know, I believe since Abraham knew how to run his household, why wouldn't he preach the gospel to his children? You know, especially Ishmael was with them at least until he was 13. That's when he got circumcised. And again, he got, you know, he got circumcised. I believe he was saved. I believe he followed the Lord. And I believe he loved Abraham, which is why he shows back up then to honor him and respect him at his funeral to, uh, to bury him with Isaac. But let's keep reading here because that's that, that idea, though, of, of, of people just really kind of giving Ishmael a bad rap. It's more has more to do with his descendants and the people that, that came as a result of Ishmael, not Ishmael the person as a, as a result. And, it, and we're going to see that's going to tie in with when we talk about Esau in a little bit here. But let's keep reading. It says, uh, verse 11, and it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt by the well Lehiroi. Now these are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's handmaid, bare unto Abraham. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names. Let's skip down instead of reading all the names because I'm not, not going to go through any of this with the names of Ishmael. Um, basically, there's 12 princes at the end of verse 16, 12 of princes according to their nations. Ishmael was blessed. And he was blessed with, with you know, 12, descent, you know, 12 sons and, and they became princes and they became a mighty people and they truly were blessed of God. And, you know, I believe for Abraham's sake, but still it was a, it was a great blessing that he received as well. Ishmael received a blessing and so did Isaac. <coughs> Verse um, 17. And these are the years of the life of Ishmael. Ishmael also lived, lived a, a long life. It says here, in 130 and seven years, and he gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people. Now, I'm not dogmatic about it, but from what I've seen and what I can remember, when you see the Bible using the phrase like giving up the ghost, I believe that's, that's referring to people who have already been saved. When they give up the ghost as opposed to people, <coughs> excuse me, damn. You have to bear with me with this cough. As opposed to people just saying, you know, dying and, and use another terminology for dying. And again, I'm not dogmatic about that. I don't have like, you know, tons of evidence and proof. You just have to look it up for yourself and see if you agree. <coughs> but let's keep reading here. Verse 18, And they dwelt from Havilah to Shur, that is before Egypt, as thou goest toward Assyria. And he died in the presence of all his brethren. <coughs> Verse 19. And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister to Laban the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. That word barren means that she wasn't having any children. Her <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the word barren is referring to her womb as being empty or desolate. There's, there's nothing there because she wasn't having children. So because she wasn't having children and because... They wanted to have children because they know that children are a blessing. And we went over that last week. It says, Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife. 
<coughs> because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. So here we see God answering his prayers. But what I want to point out that's really interesting about this, and many people probably just overread this in your Bible reading, look at what it says. Let's jump down <clears throat> to verse number 26. Because remember, Abraham, it says, was 40 years old when he got married to Rebekah. She did, wasn't having any children, so he prays to God. Look at what it says in verse number 26. The Bible says, And after that his brother came out, talking about Jacob and Esau being born, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was, look at this, Isaac was three score years old when she bare them. A score is 20 years, three score is 60. Isaac was 40 years old when he got married. 20 years have gone by before he finally had a child. <clears throat> when you read in verses 20 and 21, especially in verse 21, it says, well, Isaac entreated the Lord and the Lord answered his prayer. And it looks like it's just immediate, right? Because we're just reading it. We're, we're, we're reading an account of someone else's life and their lifespan and their lifetime and all these things that happen. We read them real quick. We see there in the very same verse, yeah, God, God answered that prayer. We need to keep this in mind that we may go to God with prayer and you may think that God's not answering your prayer. You may think that God's not listening to you. <coughs> but that's not necessarily the case. You have to understand that God's going to answer you in His own time and in His own way. And it's going to be ultimately, I believe, what's best for you. Now, when we go to God in prayer, there's a lot of things that we have to keep in mind. You know, we ought to be living a righteous life and doing things according to His will. And I've used this example plenty of times, but with my own children, you know, the more right things they're doing, the more they're listening and obeying me, the more likely I'm going to be to listen to them when they want something. The, 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 them showing that they want to listen to what I have to say will make me want to listen to them more and more and more. It's the same way with God. Okay, And the other thing with God is that if we just go asking for stupid things or we ask for things to consume upon our own lusts, things that aren't good for us, right? why would God want to give us that? It's not going to help us at all. So he's, you know, there, there's certain things that, that God's not going to give us exactly necessarily what we ask for but He'll always do even better because He is a loving Father. We know that God loves us because we know that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross to pay for all of our sins and we don't deserve any of it. That should show you enough how much God loves you. So knowing, knowing that God loves you so much, there is no reason not to go to God in prayer for everything because God answers prayer. God wants to hear from you. God wants you to rely on Him. Just like our salvation, we rely on Jesus Christ. We're completely trusting in Him. We're not trusting in ourselves at all. Well, with other needs that we have, with our physical needs, you know, we need to be relying on God. You know, it's a shame it was brought to my attention that there was a, there was a pastor that was told, you know, he was working full-time, the church was kind of small and struggling, and uh, so he had a full-time job as well as pastoring, which is exactly what I'm doing right now, right? And I guess his boss told him, basically an ultimatum, and said, well, you can either keep working for me or the church, or you can't have both. He was saying it's either the church or this job. And the pastor chose his job. And that's just a shame because that shows zero faith in God to supply your needs. Now, <clears throat> you may say, well, that's easy for you to say because you haven't had that choice or whatever. But look, I'll tell you right now, if, if, if it came down to my job or this church, if I had to choose one, if my boss put me in that position 
It's not even a thought. My thinking is going to be, well, praise the Lord that God's got something else lined up for me then in some way to take care of me because I know, I know that if I'm doing what's right according to God's will, He is not going to leave me and my family struggling for, to, to, to feed ourselves or to, or to have clothing. He's promised those things unto us. I don't know where it's going to come from necessarily, but I know He's going to make it happen. Now, I'm going to do my hardest to work and I'd have to find another job, but I'm just going to think, hey, God's got some other better job lined up for me already. But I am not going to forsake the church and forsake this people because my secular boss says, well, you know, the church is taking up too much of your time or whatever, so I'm going to fire you if you don't quit the church. That's sad. Sad that that happened, but, um, you know, we need to be able to rely on God. And here's the thing, I'm getting a little bit off topic, but with the prayer, you know, Isaac had to wait 20 years. And here's another thing I want to bring up about this. This is something that people get really emotional about, and I understand why. <coughs> Having children. You know, a lot, these days, couples get married, and they want to have children immediately. And I don't blame them. I did too. When we got married, I want to get ch have children right away. Because, why not? I mean, we love them. We, we, we're married, let's have children. But too many Christians these days are not waiting on the Lord and not waiting on His time. And either they're not going to Him in prayer or they are, but they're just thinking, well, God's taken too long, so i got to take matters into my own hands. You remember, that's what Abraham did. Now, Abraham waited a lot longer, but ultimately he still did the same thing when, when he uh, took uh, the concubine, when he took Hagar, and Ishmael was born. He didn't wait in God's time. God had promised it to him, too. And that's the other thing. God promised him a seed and an inheritance and a blessing. He knew that before Ishmael was ever born. <coughs> so he had an answer to his prayer already. It just wasn't fulfilled yet. We need to remain steadfast in God's word and just go to him, know that he loves you, and be able to wait for his timing. God's got a reason for it. Even when we don't understand it, we, need, we ought to be <clears throat> we ought to be relying on His timeline. But these days, we live in a culture, we live in a society where too many people want things right now. It's a, it's a fast food and, and give me everything right now. It's an it's a instant gratification society that we live in. With everything. I mean, good night. There, it used to be, in my, it, when I was a child, you know, the family could sit down for dinner. And it doesn't matter if the phone rings. It doesn't matter if, you know, like even if someone comes to the door, you could sit down and you have dinner. Like, this is what we're doing as a family. Some things were kind of sacred, right? Some things were not interrupted. But with the short attention span today and people just want everything right away and demand your attention right away, now it's like, I mean, you got, you got people sitting around a dinner table all with their, their faces and their devices and they're getting, oh, wait, I got to text. Oh, wait, I got to check that. Well, I'll tell you what, that doesn't happen in this household. Someone gets a phone call, like a wait. And there's too much of this, you know, even people getting impatient with other people. You know, I just sent you a text. Why didn't you answer me right away? Because I was busy, yeah. right? And it's, it's, it's going and spreading into everything. You know, I mean, it's, it starts with like the fast food. Well, I'm hungry right now, so I'm just going to go out and just get some food. It's going to take five minutes. And people just expect to have that right away. People want you to answer them right away. People want to be able to, to just call you and reach out to you, and you're just there for them right away. And it's this instant gratification. And it could lead people into trouble. And especially when it comes to childbearing and having children, you'll have Christians now because they're already in this mindset of instant gratification. I mean, now with the supermarkets and the wall markets and stores are open 24 hours a day. Hey, if you want something, if you wake up in the middle of the night, you want something, you could just go and get it in 20 minutes. If you live in a city, if you live in somewhere that has all these things just available to you, it's at your fingertips. You don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to plan for things in today's culture, in today's society. And people now even have it to where they say, well, 
we're not having any children. They might wait a year. They might wait two years and just say, well, we're getting older. We need to have children now. And if God's not going to answer our prayer, then what are they going to do? They're going to go to the, to the doctor. They're going to go to the, the wicked science that's out there today and say, well, let's just do IVF. And I'll tell you right now, IVF ought never would be an option for a Christian family that wants to have children because IVF murders babies. Because the way that it works is they have, you know, in the Petri dish, in, you know, in, the, in their lab, they, they create all these different, um, you know, sperm and egg combinations because they know they're going to lose some of them already. So then they say, okay, well, we're going to implant the one that's, that's the strongest, the one that seems like it's going to work out the best. But then you, what do you do with all the rest of them? All the rest of the conceptions, the lives that have begun and started, they have to toss them aside because they just go with their best odds. I'll tell you what, my friends, that's wickedness. You are killing life. We need to be able to rely on God. Even if it takes 20 years, look, God will answer those prayers, but allow it to be on His time. Don't take matters into your own hands. Let's keep reading. Or let's go back a little bit because we jumped ahead to verse 26 just so I could show you that when they were born. Um, verse 22 says, And the children struggled. So this is talking about after the conception of Rebecca. The children struggled together within her. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. So she goes to God. It's the right thing to do. She goes to God in prayer like, Well, wait. You know, something's going on here. This isn't quite right. Why is it like this? You know, why, why are my kids fighting in my womb, basically, is what's going on. And um, verse 23 says, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. And two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the elder shall serve the younger. Now this is an extremely important passage to understand. When, especially when we look at the New Testament. Now keep your finger here. Turn if you would to Romans chapter 9. I'm going to discuss a, a topic tonight about Calvinism. This wicked doctrine that says that God, basically, I mean, it's hyper-Calvinism, but I don't care if you're any type of Calvinism, take it to its logical end, you're going to end up at a hyper-Calvinist state. That God picks and chooses certain people to be saved and certain people not to be saved. And um, one of the confusing part, one of the passages people are confused with is in Romans chapter 9. And we're going to read that, but... but You'll see in a minute how this ties in perfectly because it refers to this event, this story of Jacob and Esau being born. And with that phrase, the elder shall serve the younger. <coughs> but remember what it said in Genesis when God said, two nations are in thy womb. Now, did she literally have, you know, thousands of people in her womb? <laughs> Of course not. She had two, two individual persons, right? But when God referred to Jacob and Esau, he was already referring to them as nations because he already knows they're going to be born, they're going to grow up, and they're, they're going to be, they're going to have many, many descendants that are going to be nations are going to become out of their seed. God knows this. And he says, there's two nations in your womb. And the people are going to be, you know, they're going to be different from each other, but it's going to end up that the older one, the elder brother, is going to serve the younger. But he's still talking about nations. He's not talking about the actual, you know, Esau serving Jacob like, like as individuals in their lifetime. Look at Romans chapter 9, verse number 10. The Bible reads, And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. 
So, and we'll keep, we'll just, just keep reading, okay? What shall we say then? Verse 14, is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. So, we're going to pause here. This is why people get so confused about this. So they look at this and say, see, when God decides something, when God just chooses this is going to be the way it is, then that's just the way it is. So they throw in here because they'll say, well, look, the Bible says, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And they're trying to say that, see, God just, God hated Esau. And just for no other reason than that, it's because of... Um, it says in verse 11 that the purpose of God according to election might stand. That it's just the way God chose things to be. And this is, this is the, the, the messed up doctrine that they teach. And they're completely confused about what Romans 9 is actually teaching. And it's, it's very simple. And I'm going to explain it to you. And hopefully you'll see that that lines up and matches up with all the scripture that we see. But let's, um, before we get, even get into the rest of this, Romans 9, because then he, he goes and brings up the example of Pharaoh, saying how God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and all these things. But um, I want to start off with that first phrase in Romans 9, 11. It says, for the children being not yet born. So there's other thing to say. See, they haven't even done any good or evil. And the Bible's saying they haven't even done anything and God's already chosen. He's already decided. This is going to be the way things are. Now, oftentimes what they'll get confused with is God's foreknowledge in addition to, to you know, things being the way that they are and God's prophesying and saying this is the way it's going to be. But um, one thing that people get confused about, especially the Calvinists, is this idea of the elect. And even Christians get confused about this too. So here it says that the purpose of God according to election might stand. What's election? It's choosing, right? Uh, purpose of God according to election. But I just want to make a point real briefly because some people will look at the elect and they'll say, you know, in many cases, they'll say, oh, well, that's, that's talking about the physical nation of Israel. Because every time you're talking about the elect or the election, that's talking about physical Jews. And that can be easily disproved in one statement. In Romans 11, you're in Romans 9 if you want to look at it. In Romans 11, verse 7, 7 the Bible says, What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it. And the rest were blinded. So there you have... Israel as a nation, physical seed of Israel, and the election used as two different types of people. It says, Israel hath not obtained it, but the election hath obtained it. So I just wanted to throw that out there because we need to read the Bible in context. We need to understand the meaning of words, and you can't just look and see one word and see election and just say, oh, that just must be talking about the Jews, or see one word and even the word saved and say, oh, that must be talking about their soul or their spirit. No. It's not. You need to read everything in context and understand it within the context of the chapter and within the context of the whole Bible. So here it's saying, because election is, you know, electing is choosing, right? If you go to the, the poll booth and you're electing someone, you want to elect a president, you're casting your vote of who you choose to be president. That's what, that's the purpose of an election is for people to choose and to make that choice. And that's what the word just quite literally means. So, what is this talking about then? Well, it was referring to the, you know, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. This is not talking about individuals because we already saw in Genesis chapter 25 that God said there's two nations in thy womb. In the, in the exact context, in the exact verse where he said the elder shall serve the younger, he was describing nations that were going to come, that were not individuals. But the people who believe in this Calvinistic doctrine, they're applying this to individuals. They're saying, no, the, God's election you know, and God's grace is per person. 
Whereas here he's referring to an, an entire nation of people and prophesying, saying, look, because what did, what did Rebecca do? She asked God, why is it like this? Why is my pregnancy like this? Why, why is this going on in my womb? Like, why are the kids fighting? And he says, this is why. Because you have two nations. Because they're going to be different from each other. And because, you know, he says the elder is going, going to serve the younger. One people is going to be stronger than the other people. So that's, just, that's the way it's going to be. And it's going to work out that the elder serves the younger. And he says in verse 13 of Romans 9, As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now again, when it says it is written, as it is written, that's referring to Scripture. So let's turn to Malachi. Keep your finger in Romans 9. We'll be back there. Malachi chapter 1 is the reference for this Scripture. And I want to show you this also because the, the key problem that, that people have in misunderstanding Romans 9 is the application to individuals. Applying that and just saying, see, God loves some people and God hates people and he just chooses who it's going to be. It's like he just says, well, you know, this person's born today. I hate that person just because I'm sovereign and I choose to hate that person. Before they even do anything good or bad, I hate them. I love him. I hate him. You can't apply what this passage is talking about to individuals. Now, does he say, because he says, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. Those are names of people, right? But he said, as it is written. Malachi 1 is where this is written. Look at Malachi 1, verse number 2. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? So he's talking to a, a group of people. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Look at verse number 4. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness. And look at the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever and ever. So when he's referring to Jacob and Esau, he's referring again to a nation. He's referring to the whole group of people, just like today. I mean, this isn't that hard to grasp. When, people, when you hear people talking about Israel, do you have any problem understanding that they're talking about an entire nation? But Israel is the name of one person. Israel is the, literally the name that God gave Jacob. His name is Israel. It's the name of one person, yet it's also the name of a nation because nations carry on the names oftentimes of their progenitors. So when he says Jacob and when he says Esau in these passages, he's not just referring to the individual. And that's clear when you start reading the context of the places from Romans 9 that it's referring back to. When you just read Romans 9, it could be a little bit unclear. Well, is he talking about the individual people, Jacob and Esau? You can't know that for sure within that context until you go back and you look at, oh, well, in Genesis 25, he says, you know, there's two nations. He's not talking about the individual, he's talking about the nations. And then in Malachi 1, he goes on to talk about Edom and a group of people. Again, talking about the nation. God doesn't hate these individuals just because he chooses to hate them. Now, God is angry with the wicked every day, yes. And God does hate people individually, yes. And God loves people individually, yes. But it's not in the context of of what Romans 9 is talking about, especially when, they, when these Calvinists will say, well, they haven't done any good or bad, so God just decided to hate them. No. Now you're starting to twist the meaning of these scriptures. One of the reasons why Esau got punished is because they didn't help the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. They, they wouldn't let them pass through, and they were, you know, they, they were... Um, not doing what was right to them. But um, I want to point out another thing now too. Because in Romans 9, then it continues on and it talks about Pharaoh. 
And here's another thing that, here's, a, here's something that a lot of people don't get and they don't understand, is the hardening of the heart. And Calvinists will look at this and, and point to this and say, see, God did that and he made it so that Pharaoh just wouldn't do, like he, he basically took away his will so that he just would not listen and, he, you know, and God hardened his heart. And on the other end, you have people who say, well, God would never do that. And they'll say people always have a chance to get saved and that I don't care who you are, there's always an opportunity and that, and that you know, that doesn't ever end until the day you breathe your last breath. But that's false also. Okay. Here's what I want to point out. about. Let's read these passages in Romans 9. Let's, just, let's get the context of Romans 9 and then I'll cover Pharaoh and that story. Again, because again, Everything we're looking at in Romans 9, this is all referring back to Old Testament Scripture. In order to understand what is going on in Romans 9, you have to get the context and read what is going on what that it's referring to. We have to read Malachi because that's where that quote came from. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. We read that in Malachi chapter 1. And earlier in Romans 9, that it says, um, the elder shall serve the younger. That came from Genesis 25. But let's keep reading where we left off here. It says, verse 17, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and, on, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured, with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he saith also in Ozi, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. So, and again, I'll admit, on a first glance of this, without, without going back and looking at everything, it can be a little bit confusing. You say, well, wait a minute. Yeah, I was saying, you know, if God wants to do this, then who are you to say that God can't do this? But what we have to understand is the way that God does things. Because there does exist a person who is called a reprobate, someone who is rejected of God. And this is going to be the key. I'll just try to, to briefly explain it. And then we can look at some of the scriptures that will support that explanation. Okay. A reprobate is someone who is rejected. Now, because on one end of the spectrum, you'll say, well, God doesn't do that. God won't harden anyone's heart. God, you know, God doesn't do that at all. You know, everybody always has a chance to get saved. And I don't believe that to be true. I believe that God wants everyone to be saved. So don't, we can't confuse God desiring or having a will that everybody would, would come to repentance, that everybody would get saved, with everybody at every single moment of their life always having the capability of getting saved. Because that's not true. That's not the case. There are things like blaspheming the Holy Ghost. There are things like tampering with God, God's Word, adding to or removing from. Look up Revelation 22. And it'll show you there are some people that, you know, if God's taken your name out of the, out of the holy city and out of the, the book of life, he's saying, you know, you're blotted out, you're blotted out. That's done for you. There are things that you can do that cross the line with God where God will harden your heart so that you cannot get saved. You cannot put your faith on Christ because, 
And people have this, this ma major confusion over our stance on homosexuality. So many times it's just misunderstood where someone will come up, you know, someone will answer me or come up to me and say, hey, you know, so what, why do you think, you know, you think homosexuality is worse than other sins so that if someone commits homosexuality, then they can't be saved? No. The person that can't be saved has already become reprobate. They have already rejected God and done things to where God has rejected them. And the door has been closed. And they do not have the opportunity anymore for maybe it is because they blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Or maybe it is because they've tampered with God's word. Whatever the reason is that God has, has rejected them, or maybe it's just because they continually rejected God to the point where God just said, okay, now I'm going to reject you because you've heard and heard and heard and you've had opportunity after opportunity and we know God's long-suffering, but you get to a point where God just says, okay, I'm done. But it's after that point where people then burn in their lust one towards another, men with men working that which is unseemly. That is something that happens after the fact. It's not the cause of the reprobation. It's not the cause of them being rejected. It's the result of them being rejected. That's what you have to understand about, about our stance on homosexuality is that all that is is the fruit in their life, literally the fruit, the fruit cakes, their fruit showing that they've already been rejected because they're doing these vile, unnatural things that God has completely just, just let the reins off and they start becoming like an animal. That is what that's all about. But this is how God, because we know that God's long-suffering. We know that He's merciful. We know that He's not will, you know, willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That is the heart that God has. He's given us this choice. We'll see a little bit about how God operates in Pharaoh. And I've got a bunch of verses here. What I did was I found all the verses where God, where the word hardened and Pharaoh were in the same verse. And um, I just want to point this out real quick because as we read in Romans 9, it says in verse 22, what if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? He endured. He gave them an opportunity. It's not like he hardened their heart right away. They already had gotten bad and wicked and evil, and God endured that, and he was long-suffering. But he just allowed them, and he allowed them to get in their place. And that's another thing, you know, Pharaoh's life wasn't cut short by his wicked deeds because God decided just to use them and say, okay, you know, he's going to continue to be wicked. I'm going to show my power against Pharaoh. But I'll read off the verses for you. You could follow along if you want. They're just in Exodus like 7, 8, and 9. Okay? And we're going to see a little bit of the pattern here about when Pharaoh's heart is getting hardened. Okay? Because there are a lot of situations. There were different miracles that Moses was doing and Aaron were doing. Before, every time they'd approach him, there'd be something different. There's always something. And they'd say, you know, let us go. Let us go worship the Lord. We need to go. And every single time, Pharaoh refused. But I'm going to read some of these verses. Exodus 7.13 says, And he hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. So here it looks like God hardens Pharaoh's heart. But then in, in verse 14 it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuseth to let the people go. So there it's just, it, you know, there, there's, there's going to be some verses where it just says you don't know who's doing the hardening because it just says it is hardened. You know, it's, his heart was hardened. Well, was it by Pharaoh or was it by God? Well, we're going to see here that God is not the only one hardening Pharaoh's heart. And that's the main point that I want to make with this is that it's not all God just doing the hardening. Exodus 7.22 says, And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Neither did he hearken unto them as the Lord had said. Exodus 8.15 says, But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart. So Pharaoh hardened his own heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. 
Verse 19 says, Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. So there, we don't know who's doing the hardening. But uh, chapter 8, verse 32 says, And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, which means he had also done it in the past. Pharaoh hardened his own heart at this time also, neither would he let the people go. So we see multiple times Pharaoh has an opportunity because God isn't the one that hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And then it finally gets to the point, we'll see in, in, in chapter 9, verse 7, it says, And Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead, and the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. We don't know who was doing that. And then in verse 12, it says, And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. Verse 34, 934 says, And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart, he and his servants. So we see, you know, God didn't just harden his heart through this entire process. Right off the bat, he started off, he said, okay, I'm going to harden his heart. But then he's still seeing all these great plagues. This was the plague of that rain and the hail and the darkness. And I mean, they, you know, these crops are just being destroyed. He sees all of this stuff. He's seen everything else, yet Pharaoh still hardens his own heart. He has an opportunity every time to say, okay, you guys can go. But not when he's hardening his own heart. And then in verse 35, it says, And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, but that's in reference to 34, where he hardened his own heart. Um, then in chapter 10, all the rest of the, the references, we see God hardening Pharaoh's heart. And God just, just, just hardened it the rest of the way. Even in 1 Samuel 6, verse 6, it says, Wherefore then do ye harden your hearts? He's talking about to, to, the, to the children of Israel. As the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts. More evidence. See, God's not the only one doing the hardening. Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And God doesn't just pick and choose whose heart to harden just based on a whim or based on nothing. They have their opportunities themselves. And this is how someone who becomes rejected, this is literally what happens to that person. They have opportunities and they harden their own heart. They harden their heart to the gospel. They harden their heart to the truth. They reject it. They reject it until the point where God says, okay, because look, all anyone would ever have to do, and this is what people say, well, what if someone who's a homo believes on the Lord Jesus Christ? What if that happens? Well, if that happens, they're saved. They say, well, what if, what if they, they still are a homo? What if they still continue in this stuff? If they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're saved because that's what the Bible says. And if they weren't saved, then this book is not true. But see, the repent of your sins crowd doesn't like that because they don't want to hear about any homos and, oh, well, if they're, if they're still practicing, then they didn't repent so, you know, because they believe in a works-based salvation. But here's the key. And this is what people don't get. Once God has hardened your heart because you've rejected him, rejected him, rejected him, and he's re reprobated you, it becomes incapable for them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like it said, you know, that in seeing they shall see and not perceive, in hearing they may hear and not understand. That is the way the rest of their life goes. Once God has rejected somebody, he has hardened their heart to the point where it is literally impossible for them to put their faith on Jesus Christ. That is the way the reprobate works. So you saying, well, what if a homo would put his faith on Christ? It's not going to happen. It can't happen because he's already been rejected, which is evidenced by his wicked lifestyle, which is evidenced in Romans 1. And you know what? I'll just read this for the sake of, of having it in here because I don't want to make a whole bunch of too many claims without showing the evidence. I'll read it for you in Romans chapter 1. In verse number 21, because that when they knew God, again, people who they've had the opportunity, they heard and known about God. When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. 
professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So far, not saying anything about sodomy, homosexuality, anything like that, right? This is just talking about people who they knew God, they heard about him, but they didn't glorify him as God. They lowered God to an animal. They just made some idol and they made up their own God. <coughs> because of this, verse number 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, again, for this reason, not because they already were homos, but for this reason, because they worshipped and served the creature more than the creator, because they knew God and they glorified him not as God, because they had opportunities and they decided to reject it over and over and over again. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. It clearly says God gave them up. God gave up on them. God gave them up to do that stuff because they wouldn't normally do it unless God had given them over to do that stuff. That is not something that any normal human being would ever do. You have to be given up to do those things. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Don't put the cart before the horse. They didn't want to have anything to do with God. They rejected God. They brought God down to a creature. And then God rejected them. Did God want them to be saved? Yes. Otherwise, how do you even explain them hearing about God and hearing the gospel and hearing this stuff? Because God wanted them to be saved, but they rejected. Their foolish heart was darkened. And th yeah, think about that too, because that's exactly in verse 21, it says, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. This is the hardening, the darkening of the heart that we're talking about. It's they've gotten to that point where God has just closed them off and they, it's no longer possible for them to receive Christ for their salvation. And it's sad, but that's the truth. And once they've been given up on, then their verse 29 says, being filled, talking about the same people, the same reprobates, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Those are all of the attributes of the reprobate. So when you see someone that has all these attributes, you know they're reprobate. When you see someone that's, you know, a homo and they hate God and they're proud, which is like all the homos anyways, right? All of these different things, they're full of fornication and wickedness and uncleanness. That's what the Bible says a reprobate is. That identifies them as reprobates. They've already been rejected. But, see, God, the, 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 you can't take that to the other extreme of Calvinism and just saying, well, God just picks and chooses people to be like that. As if God wants people walking around by his sovereign will to just be like, you're going to be a reprobate. Because I want you from birth, I just want you to be extremely wicked and I just want to cast you into hell because uh, for my pleasure. That's a perverted, weird God that you, that you serve if that's what you believe God is like. 
No, people always bring it upon themselves is what the point I was making. Even with Pharaoh, Pharaoh brought it upon himself. He rejected God. He rejected the children of Israel. He rejected the message and the warnings. He rejected it all. He hardened his own heart and then God hardened his heart. It's not something that God just decided to do on a whim because he decided to do it. So let's go back. Where was I here? I'm done with Romans 9. Let's go back to... Uh, well, you're in the New Testament. Flip over to Hebrews chapter 12. I'll read for me from Genesis 25 while you're getting to Hebrews 12. Because there's one other, one last point I'm going to make in this chapter. And again, there's so many references all over the place in the Bible. Um, you know, the Old Testament being referenced in the New Testament. And this story of Jacob and Esau is a pretty big story. So, we saw in Genesis 25 that there were two nations. And that's what they're referring to. Girls, stop it. Sit up straight. There were two nations that were in their womb. And we saw all these other, you know, we see how Romans 9 now is talking about those nations. And it's talking about, um, you know, how God used these people. But it's not a justification for God just picking and choosing someone from birth to be damned forever. Because that's not the way God operates. But um, So then in verse 29, I'll finish off Genesis 25. You're in Hebrews 12. Just stay in Hebrews 12. Verse 29 of Genesis 25 says, And Jacob sawed pottage. What it means is pottage is just like a soup. Right? So Jacob, he's making this soup, he's boiling the soup, he's heating it up. And Esau came from the field and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. So we see here, Esau being referred to Edom derives from him asking Jacob for that red pottage because he's faint. So that's why he was called Edom. And then it says in verse 31, and Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he sware unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. This is a pretty big point in Esau's life. The birthright. The, the firstborn child, which Esau was, he was the firstborn, always receives the double portion. The, the firstborn gets, that, that's what his birthright is. It's that claim on the inheritance of him getting the double portion of the inheritance as opposed to what Jacob would get. So he says, I want you to sell that to me. He says, oh, you're real hungry? I've got some food here, but it's going to come at a cost. This is Jacob saying to his brother, which I, he shouldn't have been doing that either. But Jacob is, is, is you know, they, they always were, seem to be at odds with each other ever since the womb, right? I mean, they're always fighting with each other. So Jacob's like, okay, well, you're so hungry, then sell me your birthright. Now, J Esau had no respect, apparently, unto his birthright. Esau, we see many examples of him kind of living for himself and his flesh and his appetite and just fulfilling and satisfying his appetite. Now, <coughs> I believe this was kind of an exaggeration of saying that like, well, I'm going to die if I don't eat because I'm just so hungry. If I don't eat right now, I'm just going to die. So what good is that birthright going to do me anyways if I'm dead? Because that's basically what he said. And after he did that, he despised his birthright. He didn't want to have anything to do with it because he knew it wasn't his. And what a horrible place to be in for Esau because when you work, you know, they're working and helping out their dad and working and, and you know, accumulating their wealth and building everything up as a family and, and keeping everything in line. Esau's not going to get any of that stuff now because he sold his birthright. And he despises his birthright now because he ain't going to get it because he already sold it. And look at what look at the, the, the value that he traded. 
the birthright, which is, you know, again, it's, that's, that's a huge price to pay. Now, you don't have it right now. It's something you get much later in life. But he traded all of that for a bowl of soup. One bowl of soup. Hebrews 12 talks about this, this very same event. Look at verse number 14 of Hebrews 12. The Bible reads, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now we also have to be careful. You know, it, this is another passage that people have a tendency to, to not in, understand correctly. They'll either say, they believe that you can lose your salvation because of this example, or um, they'll just misinterpret what this is talking about with Esau seeking repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Because it says, afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. Now, you remember when, when uh, it's going to come up in the next couple chapters, when Isaac blesses his children, when he gets real old, and we'll see that story pro probably next week, um, if not the week after. Jacob tricks Isaac into thinking that he's Esau and he steals the blessing from Esau and we'll turn it turn if you would to Genesis 27 this is the last place we'll turn Genesis 27 and you'll see this. so that's going to be not next week but the week after Genesis 27 where is our reading verse number 34 after Jacob deceives Isaac and he receives that full blessing that, that was meant for Esau. Esau comes in then and, and Isaac finally understands what happened and that he was tricked. And uh, Esau gets really upset because he didn't get the blessing. So look at verse number 34. It says, and when Esau heard the words of his father, because Isaac was like, well, he's going to be blessed. Like I already blessed him. He's going to receive that blessing. Talking about Jacob. He's like, I, it's already over. I did it, you know. In verse 34, it says, And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, Thy brother came with subtlety and hath taken away thy blessing. And he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob? For he hath supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, Hath thou not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants. And with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And, um, and he goes on and gives him the small blessing. But what we see here, this is what's being referred to in Hebrews 12 when it says afterward when he would have inherited the blessing, right? The blessing that he was supposed to get, he was rejected. Isaac didn't give him the blessing he was looking for. And that's why it says, for he found no place of repentance. The repentance wasn't from Esau. The repentance he was looking for was from Isaac to repent and to give him a blessing. But he says he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. We saw here he was lifting up his voice and weeping and crying and begging and asking his father, please bless me, please give me something. That is what is referred to here in Hebrews chapter 12, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. It's not referring to Esau's eternal salvation of him not coming to repentance. The, again, everything needs to be read in context and going back to the chapters and to the, the stories that are, that are referred to in order for us to properly understand what it's talking about. <clears throat> Let me 
sure. I got my notes a little bit out of order. So the main theme of this, I wanted to point out, of this whole chapter, I'm going to close with this, was, you know, get everything in context. And we see here that there's these two nations are being referred to. It's not the individual that's God, that God is um, necessarily hating here. He's talking about these nations and the judgment that's going to come on them. And God doesn't pick and choose people who are going to personally be saved or not, just based on his own will. God wants everyone to be saved. But in order to understand these passages that might be a little bit troublesome, we need to always be able to go back to what they're referring to in order to get that context. That's why I was in word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. Um, I know I did a lot of jumping around tonight, and, and I hope that it was presented in a way that's clear for, for everyone to understand, dear God. But um, help us to gain more wisdom and understand more about you and, and the way that you operate through your word. Help us never to get to get tricked by the by the slight of men and their their cunning craftiness and false doctrine because they they like to go a lot of people will go to verses and chapters and set and portions of scripture um, that they that might seem a little bit confusing without having the full backstory and the full context of what's going on dear lord i pray that you please help us to be on guard against that and help us just to know our bible so that nobody will be able to uh, deceive us or trick us in that manner it's so in Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. All right, let's sing one more song before we are dismissed. Song number 143, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, Psalm 143. You know, Calvinists don't have any assurance. Because it's funny, it's like, you ask any Calvinist, of course they're all saved. And of course they're the chosen ones, right? They're the elect. They're the ones who God's going to Well, yeah, God chose me. I don't know about you, but he chose me. But, uh, then when you say, well, what about this guy? He was one of the chosen ones, and now he's off and you know, out of church and everything. Well, he was never chosen to begin with. right? So they don't ever know. Because what if they end up getting out of church or whatever? Then I guess they weren't one of the chosen ones either. They don't have this blessed assurance that we do.